let's give a warm welcome for Kukufu Zubair. turn this thing on on my voice may get weaker as I go on. Thank you very much. I want to thank the people who organized this. I'll turn that back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I sounded better than that. Did you hear me back there? You got me all right. It's all right, good. So um, I, I want to thank the organizers for uh, for putting this all together and inviting me out. Uh, Randall, uh, thank you very much uh, for thinking about me in the context of, uh, of, of the theme that you have. Uh, let me give you one kind of, um, and I, I do think that this is important, there's an assumption that underlies my very presence among you. I didn't just become an academic to to get tenure, although I have tenure. <laughs> I didn't become an academic just to talk to other academics, although I spend most of my time doing that. And as the chair, I spend more of my time than I would ever care to talking to other academics in very intimate ways. So it's, it's, those are not my motivations, however, for becoming an academic. I am uh, like one of those people who was a very idealistic student who thought that what I wanted to spend my life doing was helping people and doing things to transform the world. And so it was in my spectrum of, uh, of consideration, it considered what are the best ways that I can do this. So by getting a PhD, I thought that this would be the best way for me to make a contribution. I had been involved in social movements and things of that nature and concluded that I couldn't fight that well so I wasn't going to be beating anybody up in the submission of doing the right thing. But one thing I could definitely do is I could talk people into submission. And so if I could do enough talking and have enough weight behind my talking, I thought I might be able to convince people of some things which were important. Now, the problem with academics is they all feel that they can talk everybody into submission. And we do this on a regular basis, usually by publishing our paper, which we always think is the definitive paper, or on the way to being the definitive paper on a particular subject matter. So I have uh, tried to tackle questions and problems which allow me to address what I think are very human issues and problems that we need to resolve. Uh, and in many ways that has been dealing and confronting uh, scholars on some of the things I think we ought to be doing in order to enhance the quality of life uh, that we, we see on planet Earth. Another way is by participating in uh, academics in a way which bring me uh, very close to policy makers. Uh, you know, whether that's the big time policy makers in the form of the World Economic, or in the shape of the World Economic Forum, or in kind of, you know, just small consultations with heads of state or ministers or people who run statistics offices. And all of this has, uh, I think, allowed me to stay within the confines of my very narrow desire to do at least a little bit of something to improve the world that we're in as I practice uh, this social science. And I, I think that's important because I think it's very important for social scientists to not be hesitant to use their social scientific knowledge to help change the world. I always tell students that, you know, uh, there is this one kind of trend among social scientists which says you need to be objective science. You need to be outside of it and get, you know, away from it. And, and I always tell them that's a frightening notion in my mind because you're going to get away from the people that you're studying. I'm not sure what kind of job you're going to do. And if you're objective, I can see, you know, Martian come down, they're objective. They have no kind of interest, no connection. They're totally out of the box. But I don't want a Martian type analysis of the human planet situation as I try to solve human problems 
and make the situation better. So I think it is very important for social scientists to not be hesitant to take what we learn and to confront each other in a very self-reflective way and also to challenge the world to at least see and take seriously uh, what we do. I had an interesting conversation over lunch yesterday with one of my colleagues who does a lot of work in, in Washington and she was saying that she was very frustrated because in every single venue that she went there was a disregard for social scientific research and the, the disregard was pretty rampant and becoming more and more rampant that is the, there were solutions but the solutions were derived around political conversations and consideration rather than thinking about some of the social science which has shown the way to succeed with some policies and why some policies have not uh, have not have not uh, have not worked, and the frightening thing is, and this is really frightening, is she said it has gotten worse in the last couple of years, right? And I was like, God, I mean, at least the guy can read the book up, right? Can you know, come on, give us some direction. <laughs> but what I want to talk to you about today is the use of racial statistics in social science and uh, the, some of the pitfalls of how it's used. And to do that, I want to consider just three basic things. Racial data, racial statistics, and to look at how that problem of racial statistics is really problematic when we look at race as a social cause or even race, race as a biological cause within these processes. So I want to start by just looking at um, what racial statistics are. And I want to offer, just up front, full disclosure, that for me, racial statistics are really about justifications of racial stratification. Some people do it good, some people do it bad. Some people are nice about it, some people are not nice about it. And you know, in some ways I feel very uh, empowered to talk about this because most of the things that I, I talk about as being wrong and that I advise people not to do and that you know, I, I could suggest many ways you could do whatever you think you want to do in a better way is because I did it the wrong way. I have published very widely using the statistics the wrong way. And it was only after I had a moment uh, you know, I was chasing all the stuff up to full professor, and I, then I got there and I started slowing down and thinking. I only had a moment to think about what I was doing that I became very self-reflective and critical about what I had done. And when I really peered into the epistemological grounds and tried to work my way up to doing what I was doing, I thought there are some fundamental uh, pitfalls here. And it might be good if we consider these pitfalls. Uh, and so, and that's, you know, one of the big things that I want to talk to you about. Now, the history of statistics is grounded in the idea of the justification of racial uh, stratification, or more specifically, of white supremacy. You know, you had people like Galton who did these wonderful books in terms of the history of statistics. It gives us what we use when we use statistics, and it helped shape our brains to really accept the, uh, the science of statistics. I always am, am you know, gratified that in a, in a close argument where everything is tense, all I have to do is jump into numbers and start citing some this and some that, and give this, and then just tear down the other person's use of numbers, and I win. And they, they don't much say anything. They're like, oh yeah, I forgot you had that whole thing going on. <laughs> and, you know, and some of that I attribute to the place that statistics have taken in the social sciences. So that, for the most part, when you want to find the science in social sciences, you don't look very hard at the theory. You don't look very hard at, you know, the history of it. You look very hard at the methods. And the method, which is the most scientific method, among the social sciences, within the social sciences, are the statistical methods. And they claim this legitimacy because of their parallel use uh, in the sciences. And you know, and this is, is, in some ways, people like to think it's being mathematical, but it's really not. 
it's being statistical. But this started with Galton. In these three books, uh, he, he, he began a process of looking at, at genius, at intelligence, uh, and to talk about how these things could be better measured statistically. And that his idea really wasn't, that Galton's idea really wasn't that you just measure intelligence and you gave a statistical result. His idea, if you read his early papers, were that the statistical result allowed you to see something that you couldn't see before. So that the answer was in the data. And if you wanted to know what intelligence was about, you could look in the data. And they developed a lot of techniques that followed in this strain of being able to measure intelligence by collecting some statistical data. Now, the test and their ability to be translated into some index, which could then be used with a whole series of indices to give you something that uh, looked like or measured what intelligence was, was it, it had a long history. I mean, you know, a trust pyramid, rank correlation coefficient, it, it really advanced on what Galton was doing by trying to show how those who scored high on one kind of uh, intellectual test tended to score high on others. And he further refined the, uh, the concept of intelligence uh, statistically. Now, the success of the IQ test kind of really formalized the belief in the standardized ability to analyze intelligence by the use of statistical methods. And every now and then, somebody writes a very important book. And I think the last one on this was Herrnstein and Murray's book called The Bell Curve, in which he regurgitated some of the arguments. I mean, the book is, if you read the, the front of the book, you got this uh, uh, dedication to Galton and Spearman as kind of the founders of what he was trying to talk about. But this book continued that tradition. Of, of made basically arguing that we could better understand uh, human uh, intellectual potential by giving these tests and giving a standardized test and then using that standardized test to really match the uh, ideal of meritocracy. The ideal that merit is how someone uh, was really getting their way through the system, ending up at a university to study, being uh, admitted to graduate school, gave us a, a kind of really objective measure to do that. And it was in many, many ways, it was uh, developed and based upon the articulation of these kinds of racial statistics. Now, Galton, one of the things I, I did mention about Galton, Galton is that Galton also coined a term called eugenics. Now, eugenics was not, you know, kind of the racial hygiene or racial sciences of the Nazis, but it definitely uh, was a precursor to that science and to the articulation of that science. But Galton uh, saw uh, these, his statistical methods as a way of galvanizing a movement around purifying the human, uh, human, human race. I mean, he thought his experience in South Africa had confirmed to him that Africans were, were, were inferior. I mean, there, there was no doubt about it. He had, you know, he had suspicions when he was in England. But these suspicions were confirmed by his experience at Vatistan when he visited South Africa. In Johannesburg, there's a university <coughs> at Vatistan. And his experience there, really, you know, looking at the Africans and then comparing them with the Europeans, he wrote back, this is just a wonderful, experiment or demonstration of the superiority of uh, the upper class uh, white people. Galton, you know, he wasn't confused. He, he didn't really like dumb white people, and he didn't really like sick white people, and he definitely didn't like poor white people. Unlike Malthus, he thought you could just eliminate those people. In fact, it would be better if those people were forbidden from having children, and if they did have children, you just sent them out somewhere so they could starve to death. All of this giving them people's good earned money to take care of them is kind of a crazy, crazy idea. It's crazy talk. And, uh, you know, you, there are some people who still think that's crazy talk today, right? So, but Golden was, in, you know, he's an early, uh, early person uh, advocating that social welfare programs were a bad thing. 
uh, unless you do them for the rich who could use them in a very positive way to make and have positive outcomes. In some ways, some people still believe in that, and some people practice that. They give a lot of money to people who have lots of money. Uh, and then you want to give very little money to people who have very little money because they seem to be not that deserving. But this idea, he formulized into a movement called eugenics. And eugenics was not only an intellectual movement, that is, most of the first uh, statistics move, you know, when you get, you get Pearson and, and, and uh, Galton and Davenport, you get these guys in a room and they're talking about statistics and these are the fathers, if you will, of statistics. They're talking about statistics and they're talking about racial purity. And this was very important to them because they needed to clean, clean the white race was obvious. You needed to do that. Now those other people, if you could get the smart white people to have more babies, you could clean out some of those areas, move good, smart white people into those areas, and things would really improve. And a good example is that, look at the United States. I mean, white people were running things. They bring other white people in. Their problem is that some of the white people they were bringing in were of the inferior sort, and something needed to be done. And hence, policies were made. A movement was built around it. Laws were passed restricting immigration. Certain kinds of conversations about the inferiority of immigrants coming from the wrong kind of European country. It's not all white people were meant to be superior, just like all of them are not. And yeah, it's kind of a weak racial superiority theory if you're going to take poor people a minute as well. Um, but, you know, if you really look at the kind of Nazi race policy, one of the interesting things I saw, I tried to do some intellectual history on, you know, where they got some of the ideas about how to, you know, get the whole racial hygiene thing together, get it clean, get the good, get, you know, get smart white people uh, moving along and stop the others. California had one of the most successful sterilization uh, programs at that time. This legislation had a lot more potential than was actually carried out. But a lot of, uh, a lot of women were sterilized and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, abortions uh, were had among Native American people, among uh, African Americans, uh, the few there were, and among uh, some of those uh, white people who were kind of inferior in terms of their physical capabilities. Either they were deformed in some way or they had something, and they, but mainly they didn't have money. And they were looking for somebody else to take care of the birth and the health care, and that ended up putting them in a situation where they got sterilized, where they were abortion was um, But when, when these two guys uh, out of uh, the California Star book, they wrote a book. California study wrote a book called Sterilization for Human Betterment. Uh, this was seen as, as, as science. So they were talking about how you could really reduce the amount of uh, bad uh, births. You know, one, some people, you just knew they need you. What is a Native American having a baby for? What is an African American having a baby for? I mean, you know, these people, is, is, is Clear. But you could have policies which could also apply to the weaker of the white species as well. And if you could get those people weeded out, the, the, the good white people would come in. You could select for the kind of characteristics, the kind of traits that you might want a child to have. And then you could basically produce those kind of children. So whatever your theory, whatever your thesis about human superiority was, you could use that in order to select the best kind of child. You could have men and women matched based on that. They didn't have the genetic technology that they have today to help you select the best kind of baby that you will have. But, you know, and they didn't have the genomic research which they have today. So I guess now, because the term has come back into fashion, it went out of fashion after World War II. People didn't walk around calling themselves eugenists. But now people, doctors, and I've had arguments with doctors and panels where at the American Medical Association where they have <coughs> doctors in there, and they will argue this eugenics thing is something different now. And they, don't, they regret being compared in this way to those uh, eugenists because they have genetics on their side and they have science on their side. And I tried to convince them that these guys claim they had science on their side as well. 
Um, but it's not that I know about genetics or this whole human genome thing. And perhaps they do have more science on their side than I, I actually understand. But the rise of the new eugenics, you can pick your baby, but you have better science in the picking of the baby. But here it's kind of just true, old-fashioned racism guiding the selection of what it's about. Now, the kind of articulation of these ideas, as I suggested to you earlier, it didn't stop really back with those guys. And it, it continued. And here are just a, a few more examples of how these books keep coming out. And they, they keep coming out. And, and you know, and, and uh, I probably the latest and the best came out about 17 years ago. I think about 17 years. Wow, time flies. It doesn't seem like 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. 17 years ago. But there's a, a ton of other research which is supporting the same kind of thing. But the, the interesting thing is if you read the review of, uh, uh, of this book, The Bell Curve, in, uh, and I think The Bell Curve is really a transitional moment. If you read the reviews of it in AJS and several other very prominent sociological journals, you will be shocked to find that they didn't criticize or trash the book. Very distinguished scholars who worked on issues of race praised the book as being a step forward in science. And in fact, a lot more research has been done where the idea of integrating biology and biomarkers into the study of uh, social processes is on the rise. It's increasing. It's not going down. And using race in those studies, and in fact using race as one of the components of the biomarkers, has increased. And the legitimacy of this practice, I think, really accelerated around the time that this book uh, was, was written. The president of, I remember the president of the, a, uh, the PA, the Population Association of America at that time, was one of the leaders of uh, this collection of biomarkers and data. And that has done nothing but proliferate. And I remember listening to his uh, a PAA speech and thinking, wow, you know, he sounds good. He's a good guy. Everything he's saying sounds good. But I'm kind of worried. This kind of still smacks and smells the same way the other stuff used to smell. I know now you can get spit. And you don't have to just look at someone and determine all of their biological stuff. You can determine it from their spit. And I, I recognize it's a debatable issue whether that spit is really enhancing people's understanding of what, uh, what race is about. But the claims are there. And now the claims are so powerful that you have the development of entire industries around it, right, to uh, help, uh, in, help bring down the racial differences, to fight health disparities, to, 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 to help develop medicines which are specifically geared for uh, racial groups, so that the race-specific uh, medicine uh, industry is on the rise, and, and it's on the rise in a very shocking way. Now, in, this, in case I faint or something, do not give me any of that medicine. I want to take the same thing that white people are taking. <laughs> not that I don't trust these companies. There's something a little weird about when they start saying, we have black medicine and everybody else medicine. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't trust America or anything, but just give me the same thing they give the white guy. I just want to go on record. If they, give, if they don't give the medicine to white people, don't just start trying to push it in my arm. And I want the same kind of diagnosis they're going to give them as well. And this is why I want that. Because I think that uh, there is a mistake in how people are looking at what race is. And so I want to try to outline what I think those problems are and what I think a solution is. So for me, an individual's race cannot be a cause of their social or biological status. Now, nobody is really saying, everybody admits race is a social construction. Most people admit race is a social construction. Maybe about 95, 90, 80 percent of people admit, 80 percent of scholars admit that race is a socially constructed process. Okay? And of that 80 percent of scholars, maybe 40 percent really believe that. Because if you question them about what is this process of social construction, who did the constructing, why did they construct it, 
who, who benefits from the construction, and where did social constructionist theory come from, you will find out that many of them don't know what, anything about any of that stuff. But they will say it. And, and watch. Next time somebody gets up and they say, well, my variable race, and ask them what is it, they'll say, oh, it's, it's socially constructed. Sorry, it's socially constructed. I believe that. And then they will proceed in their analysis. Part of the reason that they will proceed in their analysis is that even though they believe that race is socially constructed, they will also believe that it can be a cause of their social or their biological status. So they, okay, it's socially constructed. But that, what does that have to do with this putting someone in a particular position or in a particular space relative to either their health or their environment. So when we use race as a cause in the social sciences, it leads to an incorrect understanding of what I would suggest to you is a process. So rather than looking at race as if it is a thing or a kind of individual characteristic, I want to suggest to you that really racial identity race rests on the experience of shared social relationships rather than any kind of unitary shared subjective characteristic. Now that itself could have both environmental and biological consequences because the environment and our own biological status are interactive and if you concentrate people in a particular place and you spray them with something or give them something that is a common thing you give them, then it will have an impact on their body. So yes, if you concentrate people in roach, rat infested housing complexes, and they will begin to develop things in those kinds of environments. If you put them in these places and segregate them from interaction with other groups, of course, they will begin to manifest some common things about them, sales biologically. But mainly, even that is based upon their racial identity being a consequence of their shared social relationship, not their shared subjective characteristics. Because there is, the whole genetic way they talk about this is that there are more, uh, there are more differences within the group, any racial group, than among different racial groups. Now I know, you know, there, there is a, this idea, uh, there's this idea that, that, that race may be biological, and especially now, uh, believe it or not, there's an increase of research showing that definitely race could be biological. Right? I mean, you know, it's, it's like it, it took time. I knew it was coming though. First, the first thing, as soon as they finished doing mapping the genome, they took, did a little simple study. They tried to see if they could recreate an Asian, just randomly, recreate a Negro, just randomly from their day, recreate a white person, and it didn't work. They said, ah, we couldn't do it. You know, if we take these things and don't look at what the race of the person is, we can't recreate their race by looking at the kind of genomic profile that and they had a news conference, it was a big thing. I used to show the news conference in my class. See, even the genomic people said. Now you have a couple of genomic centers, people doing research, where they're questioning that earlier research and saying that, you know, those people may not have done it carefully enough, and they're coming out with different levels of results. So, you know, whether you can recreate a black person genomically, even though it's socially constructed, is up for a question, and that's being debated again. When they figure that out, you all should be concerned. <laughs> so, you know, I like to say that from a scientific point of view, advances in biological anthropology and human genetics signal the death of biological-based notions of race. But as I'm saying, that's not true anymore. But let's assume that, you know, this is just a tangent of some people who <coughs> you know, hung around, read too much gold and started believing that crap and bringing the ideas back. And but if we assume they're, they're, they're correct, that this research that race isn't biologically based, then racial data implicitly defines race from what I want to call a statistical point of view. And what I mean by that is that the person's race, it really refers to their 
being socially defined as that race. It has nothing to do with their biological constitution. So let's just take one, the number of Asian Americans in the United States is determined by asking who in the population is of Asian origin, or by sending out trained, trained, right, enumerators to count the number of Asian Americans based on some preconceived notion of who is an Asian American. I mean, they can look, you know, you look at Asian American, right, you know what they are. They all look alike, right? You know, can't tell the difference. <laughs> Asian, Korean, Japanese, bam, they're right there together. You just look at them and you know who they are. What can he possibly be talking about? So those trained people, right, they know how to find them, them, them an Asian. But they're, 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 their thing about finding an Asian is that it is, it is totally a socially constructed idea that they've been given to go out and reconfirm in whatever they're searching for. And I could have used any other group. I mean, you know, the other groups, they all look alike too, right? So, you know, but, so racial classification does not require a biomedical evaluation. That is, they haven't, so if they could come in this room, they say, okay, let's see who's an Asian. And they come in, they tell everybody, open their mouth, they scrub on your mouth, and get some spit, and go in the back of the room and configure it up. It might come out that none of us are Asian Americans. You never know. None of us could be Asian Americans. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I really found this amusing. There's this guy who has a television show. Uh, his name is uh, Skip Gates. So he was tracing the heritage of the American going to various famous people and finding out who they were. And then he did it on himself. Very bold move. And he went and he did it. And he came and he, he showed and he said, I'm white. <laughs> and then all the evidence pointed to him being white. And he said, you know, but that's crazy. I ain't white. I'm a black man. And I'm black. Afro-American studies at Harvard. I'm validated. Friend of Obama's, I'm black. <laughs> and, that ended. and he could do that because, and the police believed him when they came into his house and treated him like they would treat most black men in his neighborhood. So that, you know, the, the, the idea is that, yeah, he could find that he was this genomic black from the company that he founded and make a lot of money to turn into a tribe people. That's what we're talking about. He could do that, but uh, and and that was nice and cool. And he has certification showing that he's white, but nobody socially was prepared to treat him like he's white. Now, you know, in some ways, you could say that well, that's a problem of society catching up to the science. But I'm trying to suggest to you that the science, when it goes down this direction, is really trying to catch up with society because it, we there are things we know, right? There are health disparities among racial groups which are pretty solidly confirmed by the empirical evidence. Now, the reasons for these disparities um, you know, have to do with a lot of different things. But to, if you want to answer the question in an easy way, an easy way would be to blame it on the people who have the problem. Right? That is to, to say there's something wrong with them. And which is all this is doing. I mean, you, you already have the problem, but you can't blame it on it because of all this whole, you know, the Nazis almost destroyed the world, that kind of thing. So people kind of got away from just blaming people's genetic uh, you know, constitution as the reason they deserve to be eliminated or to let die slowly by not investing in their health and things of that nature. So you don't have that. However, increasingly there is this idea that we need to find those biological causes. We need to find those biomarkers as a way to appreciate fully the extent of the, uh, the, the disparities which exist. And this is, you know, if you, you look at a lot of the, uh, the, the requests for proposals, even at NIH, they're asking for these biomarkers. They're asking how you're going to look at the biological differences among different subpopulations in order to understand these health disparities. I think this is a, a, a problem. It's a problem in the logic of how we're thinking about race and a problem in what we think racial statistics can do for us in overcoming this limitation of our ability to understand what's happening. So let me just go through what I think these logical problems are 
And I was going to do this whole fancy kind of statistical thing, but I thought it would be better if I just talk it through. So I'm just going to talk it through. And if you have questions, we can talk fancy uh, mm -hmm. statistical things after after I'm done. But I'll, 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 I'll not burden you who are not so inclined to suffer through it. So most social sciences use experimental language when interpreting empirical results. So if they do that, they are committed, or they should be, often they're not, they should be committed to the experimental mode of analysis. Now what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that in uh, the development of statistics, there was this idea that you could do an experiment. And you could do an experiment by taking uh, your units of analysis, whatever that is, and isolating them. And then you could introduce factors and see how those factors affect your, your stuff, your units of analysis. You could introduce it in one and not introduce it in another. Or you could introduce it in one and introduce a placebo in another. And then you could measure the difference. And from that, you have created an environment which you control. Therefore, the experiment is being conducted because the introduction of your factor, let's call it, is what you think is going on. Now, think about it is that you need things that can be manipulated or altered in that process because you're introducing something and it needs to be able to change. And it is that change and that possibility of change that first you have to intellectually believe is possible, okay? You have to intellectually believe it is possible. Now you may have some evidence suggesting that it is possible, but you have to go through the thought experiment that the change can actually happen, that it can be altered or manipulated. And if it can't, then you cannot say that it causes anything. So in social statistics, causes are only things that can, in theory, be manipulated or altered. In theory, be manipulated or altered. So how you theoretically approach the question of what the thing is you're studying will determine to a great extent what you can say about that thing when you have results. So a lack of clarity in the statistical analysis of racial processes contributes a great degree of confusion about how to resolve issues of racial stratification. Now, in part, this is because I'm saying that race is not a genetic population. And nobody has proven to this day that it is. Even those people with the genomic thing, and they got one dude who they reconstructed partially, and all of that. You know, we'll see how all that turns out. I think they're going to lose. I'm betting on them. As a rule, social statisticians ignore the discussions about the meaning of race and the implications meaning has on their statistical methods. Okay, so let me, let me give a little bit of context to that then. So that you can imagine a study where someone says that uh, being black causes a person to be more likely of um, having prostate cancer. It's one of them. Being black uh, has, you know, it increases a person's likelihood of doing bad on a test. So prostate cancer, a test, two, two different things. SAT test, okay. being black. Now, I can understand that black is, being black is a factor, but being black as a cause, being black as an effect on that process is another thing altogether. Because if you take it another step, what does it actually mean? That is, if you think of it in terms of the process, what does it mean? Does it mean that the blacker a person is, the more likely they're going to get prostate cancer? That the darker the complexion of their skin, the less the score they're going to have on the test? Maybe you're black so the pencil slips and you <laughs> darken the wrong hole or you punch the wrong key. There, there's something about the complexion of the skin which is supposed to do it. So the, the logical absurdity of what it actually means is, rab, you know, is, is rarely ever pursued. So it's not unusual to be reading something in, in very prestigious journals, even the latest issue of AJS, they got an article where someone is talking about blacks. And if you read it very closely, what do they mean by black? 
is what I'm sitting there saying. Now, do they mean that these black people have uh, this tendency because of what? What is it? Is it the blackness that's underneath their skin? You know, what is it? Is it because they are more powerful? Is it black power on the rise that's giving them these particular problems? The absurdity of it is, is problematic. So that's interpreted. And that is kind of like almost obvious once you think about it, once you reflect on it. And then you have to ask, well, what are we measuring? when we capture race. What does it do for us? What can it do for us? How can we use it? Well, I want to suggest that part of the problem is that if you have race in these models, as causal or as inferential, it is a form really of racial statistics and it's a form of reasoning, which is race-based more than it is science-based. And it has nothing to do with science. Because there is no science about the blacker you are, this or that. There's nobody at a scale, okay, starting from like the whitest white person to the blackest black person, and said, this is what happens, right? The curve works like this. You go up and just go one way, but then with <laughs> crime, it goes this way, right? and all that. Nobody has done that. And the reason they haven't done that is because the, the whole thing doesn't work. Because you mix black and white, you get gray. Okay? You don't get brown, you get great. And there are no great people. There are great people, okay? I'm not trying to diss the great people, but the <laughs> typical not to have great people. But if you mix black and white, you don't get, you don't get, uh, you don't get great. And part of that is because of the other logical absurdity about what we think race is. Because what we don't have are black and white people. I know a lot of racial analysis is done on black and white, but you do not have black and white people. And I have traveled very widely, and I have actually seen some black people. I have seen a few of them, not many, but I have seen some. And I have actually seen some white people too. Very few, but they were white people. But most white people claiming white, you're just so-called white. You really aren't that white. Look at yourself in the mirror, and you won't see white. And most of you people who claim you're black, look in the mirror. You put on black, you're not the same color as your shirt. You're, not even not. you're more brown than you are black. But this is the kind of reality of what race really is about. So a scale, something which changes between that, is not going to be measured in terms of the color of the skin. So blackness is not a viable option or a viable way to do your thought experiment when you're thinking about the impact of race. And, and here's the case. So in, in, in Brazil, and this is argued, and I've, I've, I've had this discussion in Brazil quite a bit, about the idea that in Brazil, a, a black person like Pele, how I many you know Pele, football dude? Now Pele, close to black, but not quite black if you get up to him. Black and white television, he probably was black, but no. <laughs> but Pele gets classified as white in Brazil. I mean, you know, what is going on uh, You know, and so you can consider a society in which there might be more fluidity in the system of racial classification, so that if you get the right social and economic profile, you can escape being black too. Who wants to be black down there? Disparity, everything. Economics, health, everything on the bottom. If you could get white, it's logical, right? I want to be with, if everything is bad for the I want to be white. So Paley gets classified as white because he has all the stuff to, to get there. Now, if that was the process, then race would be able to be measured in this scientific way. You could put it in the models and say, ah, look, this person is point whatever, that, closer to being white. And that's good for them. So this treatment is working because it helps people get closer to being white. And since all of you, because, you know, quite frankly, if you think of it uh, statistically, and you think of it conceptually even, if, if race is not always bad, right? So we tend to look at the bad part of it because we're examining in race not everybody, but we're examining the group that's on the bottom. We're examining those people who have something wrong with them. So, you know, race has a negative effect on infant mortality rates, right? Likelihood of low birth weight. Well, now, that's only because of the way we're looking at it. We just simply reverse a couple of things. Hey, being white is good. Especially, it has a positive impact on 
birth weight of the child. So if being white has a positive effect on it, then race actually has a positive effect on, on infant mortality. But the way we talk about it is always in the reverse, because we're looking at those groups which are most disadvantaged in the racial process, therefore admitting that there's some process that we're looking at, but then we measure it as if it is not a process. And at least we measure it as if it's something that can't change. Because nobody believes that uh, Pele in America, he could come over here. Come over here, if you go try to visit Skip, police will be, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so, and how am I doing on time? Am I right? Twenty minutes. Yeah. Twenty minutes. All right. I'm gonna just run through some stuff, which is why I ended up, you know, thinking I need to write another edition of this book. And, more so why the publishers thought I needed to write another edition of this book. Um, so I'm, I'm doing that. But this, when I wrote this book, I, I went to many social science departments. Uh, you know, I mean, how, how often does a sociologist get invited by a group of economists to talk about something? You know, they invited to talk about the theses that I had. And there's, there's you know, always some questions that, uh, that, I, that, I, that I get asked. And, but one question that I always get asked, that I have to answer very quickly, is are you suggesting social scientists practice racism when they use statistical methods, statistics? Or are you suggesting that the logic of statistical methods is racist? So, you know, now those are two very fundamental questions which, you know, you, you have to answer. And this is what, you know, how I answer. Are you calling us racist? I mean, you know. It's kind of hard to call people you don't know, who haven't done anything to you, and stuff like that. Just call them, just bam, you're racist. So, no, I wasn't trying to just do that or impute motive to what they were doing. I was just trying to provide an analysis of the history and the logic of statistical analysis. And it just sounded like some people, and some of those people happened to be very prominent in their fields. Now, some of them I did cite, some of them I did say like this person. But I wasn't trying to speak about them personally. They were just examples of the general trend. Uh, and so in, in, in reality, they just became part of that history of the analysis of statistical, of the use of statistics. So no, that's, I wasn't trying to call anybody uh, a racist. But I was trying to say very clearly that the founders developed statistical analysis, as I've said to you, to explain the racial inferiority of colonial and second class citizens in the new imperial era. And that new imperial era occurs towards the, the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the uh, 19th century. So I, cr I critically evaluate the history and practice of racial statistics to suggest ways in which social statisticians correct their practice. Now, and, and the reason I called it racial statistics is because that's what they were doing. They called it racial statistics in the beginning. Galton and those guys, I mean, there were mathematics, mathematical statisticians before them. There were mathematical statisticians at the time that they were doing their eugenic stuff. But the eugenists, who happened to be, you know, Galton, Pearson, Fisher, any, any of those of you who know the history of statistics, know these great fathers of statistics, they all said they were doing racial statistics. They were all card-carrying eugenists. They were. They couldn't wait to get to those meetings in Germany where they were finally finding some like-minded people with a government that was sane. Do social scientists practice racism when they use statistics? So I use statistics in my research and I claim not to be uh, practicing racism, so I, I don't think so. But I've seen, so you know, some of the stuff that I've done, I did it wrong based on what I understand we need to do to do it right. So I think I'm in a position to speak. You know, it's just like somebody who hasn't had sex. I mean, I, don't ask them for advice on having sex. You want to get some advice on having sex? Make sure you're not talking to a virgin. Because they just read some books, they might be able to give you good advice. But, you know, so you want to talk to somebody who can talk about doing statistical analysis right, find somebody who made some mistakes and dared make some mistakes. And I've dared make some mistakes, so I think I can do that. The birth of racial statistics gave scientific credibility to justifications of racial inequality. And this is, I think, a 
very important thing to understand. Um, in more recent times, social scientists have regularly used statistics to refute racist arguments, yet by employing racial statistics incorrectly, they legitimate the use of methodologies that perpetuate the problem. I was just at a talk a couple of days ago uh, where there was an argument between a, a presenter and a person in the audience. The presenter was saying, there is no genetic basis of race. And uh, these, call, these problems are not genetically based. The interlocking person asked them the question said, well, how do you know that? Uh, there's proof that there is race. And the other person said, there is no proof there is race. And said, there's proof. And what you found is a cause of race, racial differences. There is no, what I found is a cause, you know, it's the social differences. And, you know, there was no evidence that they presented to support either argument. That's the reality of it. And this is a fundamental problem. That's why these arguments go up and down, and there is no definitive answer to be found in the data. Now, the top journals in sociology, demography, uh, routinely publish articles in which the authors discuss the effect of race and therefore basically make this problem. Now, I want to say that the social data does not tell a story. Social data does not tell a story. It can't do it. It can't talk. We use data to craft a story that comports with our understanding of the world. That's what we do. It's our understanding of the world that is important. If we begin with a racially biased view of the world, then we will end with a racially biased view of what the data has to tell us. Now, data may indeed speak to some uses of statistics. However, it only speaks to the rest of us in the voice of the researcher. I have spent many an evening analyzing data, running things on my computer, working with people. And sometimes the data does seem that it's talking to you. It's in a godlike voice coming down at you really late at night. But that is not real. You are tired. You wake up in the morning, the data is not going to be talking. You're going to be using and analyzing the data all over again. So, are you suggesting the logic of statistical methods is racist? And, okay, and this can get complicated, but in, in essence, I just want to tell you, yes. <laughs> and, and the reason is because of how we use it, not because of what the methods themselves do. And it's very different. There are people who use statistics, and then there are people who do statistics, right? There are people who use them, and I want to say the users are like the person, and this is not a criticism of you all, but the person who, to know what the statistic can do, they look at the manual. They go to the manual to figure it out, rather than say, what equation is this particular program estimating? And then, therefore, figuring from there what they're going to use that particular program to do. And in fact, sometimes, often manipulating it to make it do what they want to do. So those are two very different ways of interacting with statistical analysis. The person who actually knows what the statistic does could recreate it and could manipulate it within the particular program that they're using is, in fact, engaging with statistical analysis a very different way. So that's what I mean in terms of our, that's what I mean when I say, is the logic of statistical methods, is it, can it bias what we're doing? It can bias it in that way. If you start out not knowing what you're doing, you're not gonna end up magically knowing what you're doing by reading three paragraphs in a manual which says this is what you understand from this particular result. Especially once you stick something in, socially loaded as race or in part gender. Now, I, know I was just going to give you an example, but I think I've actually done this, so I'm going to skip that. What can we do? Now, by this time, uh, you know, if I'm talking to people, they get a little upset with me because it, well, they used to. Maybe they don't get upset with me anymore, but, and, and you all don't seem to be upset with me. That could just be your own political orientation. <laughs> But by this time, you know, they, they, they want to know, okay, it, if it's socially constructed and based on our views, what can we do? And, uh, you know, somebody usually says, well, what we really need to think about is how important is our work to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world believes us more 
when we can show them a statistical result. If you can show them empirically why something is happening, them which scientists they need to be listening to, you know, balance. You know, they, they're just listening to the popular guy with the blog. And, you know, I always go back to, Du Bois made the statement in 1899, you know, he was a contemporary of Galton. Uh, he didn't like Galton, and Galton definitely didn't like him. Uh, he was African-American, if you can't tell. And he wasn't black, he was very, what we call, light-skinned, uh, kind of African-American terminology. Uh, but this is, a, a, I thought it was always a very profound statement. He made it in the Philadelphia Negro, a social study. It says, the best available methods of sociological research are at present so liable to inaccuracies that the careful student discloses the results of individual research with definite. He knows that there are, could it be she, you know, it's Du Bois, 1899. He, she knows that they are liable to error from the seemingly errat eradicable faults of the statistics. And, you know, you could say the same thing for the genomic research which is taking place as well. So you combine the weakness in that research with the weakness in racial research. And even when that research kind of improves itself, maybe it will be more scientific and this will not be the stuff that's on the table. So let me give you my final book and then I'll entertain any questions you have or statements that you have. Race is a social process. Nothing about race is biologically based, even though some things about race do appear in a biological way. Statistical techniques reflect a history of racial reasoning, and our theories of human behavior in society, not our empirical evidence, guide how we interpret racial data. Racial data is not interpreting itself, we are interpreting it. Our view and perspective towards the world influences how we interpret this data. Racial data does not have a special feature which you press a button and it tells you what the result means. You come in thinking about the spectrum, the possibilities, what kind of results you can say comes from the data. By definition, the way you define race, you have set the limits on what kind of conclusions you can make from the data. We need a better understanding of the political and theoretical ideas that motivate different interpretation of social science results. Very important, and even you know, becoming more so important as time goes on. We can deracialize our methods before we deracialize our data. So it's not that we don't need to collect this racial data, we just need to know how to interpret it when we do collect it. So the collection of the data is something we need to do. However, I think that that is a limited project in itself as well. And that uh, the deracialization of the data, however, must await the deracialization of the circumstances that create race. Because to just stop collecting the data, it would be like not collecting racial data in South Africa after the end of apartheid. How are you going to measure the impact of apartheid? If you want to understand the significance that that had on people's lives, then you need to collect data on this socially ascribed category of race. Thank you very much. So uh, we have a reasonable amount of time uh, for questions.
maybe I don't have to go on anymore. You know yeah. what I'm mean? So, yeah. so I think that I think so. Um, let me try. Let me try two things. So one thing is that when you begin to think of race as a process, not as a thing. So you begin to think of race as shared social circumstances rather than shared individual characteristics. That already takes you into a different space. Is it semantics? Yes, it is, but it's the semantics of, of research. It's the semantics of interpreting results. It's the semantics of statistics. And these things have all to do with language. Because one of the things, statistics is not is mathematical. Statistics use mathematics, but it is not mathematical. It doesn't even have the same rules as mathematics in terms of the interpretation and the application of statistical methods to understand some problem. So the semantics are very, very important. Now, and so this little semantic change has tremendous implications because now what you're beginning to talk about are social processes and how you transform those social processes to make a change on something that you're no longer seeing as a particular point but more so seeing them as a kind of space that you need to understand. All right? Now, there are specific, if there are statistical techniques, there's a whole host of statistical techniques that you can use to do that. And some of it is the modification of techniques which are quite popular already. Some of it is the use of techniques which are in development and that people are, are beginning to use now. In terms of the policy relevance of it, I think this shift in language is fundamentally important because it does shift the kind of policy recommendations that you think you would be thinking you could get from these kind of results. And at any rate, in diagnosing what the problem is, you're already going to start at a very different point because you're already going to start at a point which is not that these individuals are the problem but that there is some process which is problematic by producing some particular outcome that you're interested in. Yes? It's a statistical question. Um, race, as you described it, it's socially constructed, of course, but it's a nominal variable. And you made reference to it as an ordinal variable at one point, you know, level of blackness. But let's take nominal categories now, which are fixed attributes. And your suggestion was that you can't use something socially constructed fixed as a causal component, as an independent variable, or anything. So do you want to generalize that to like other nominal variables? I'm thinking about the in the 1950s, there were all these so-called national character studies, you know, that you know the rest. What happened to these Germans and what happened to these Japanese and so forth. And those studies were all discredited. So why is it that the nominal variable of something like race remains alive in the field of sociology when exactly those people discredited all the national character studies? And then what do we do about nominal variables altogether in statistical analysis? Do we just forego considering them? Right. So, you know, I mean, in, in, among statisticians, this is a big question. And they wonder what the heck is wrong with social scientists, that they keep using these nominal variables. And, you know, race is one, gender is another, and there are other ways. And they use these as if they are variables. Precisely. And they're not variables. Right. But they uh, use it and, that way because they compare across. They said we've got racial categories yeah. or national origin categories right. and so they look at the between rather right. than within and you made this good point. That's but right. why does it continue then? It, it continues in, uh, so I believe that it continues because many very important social scientists have made their careers by using the variables in this way. And I come from a Pentecostal church where we could stand up and say, I've sinned, and Jesus bless you, and then you all right. You can go back out and go to the party that night. You go over again, come the next day, I've sinned, bam, you clean. But, you know, I, I don't know. So that, you know, I've just said, so I don't know why they can't stand up and say, I've done wrong, and now, you know, so all that I said, ha <laughs> ha, is not all of that, but, you know, we can move on, and I can do it right. And, and, they, and they don't.